Jay Dyer of Jay's analysis. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are, we are back. We are here. We are live. Still getting situated. And this is going to be a fun one. Welcome to Jay's Analysis. I'm your host, Jay Dyer. Today we're going to be talking about book one of on the Orthodox faith, and this is going to be extremely relevant to the Roman Catholics and perhaps even to the, the Protestants if they watch. I don't know if any of them are going to be watching, but I had so many run-ins this week on Twitter that I thought I might as well just dive into to this book. We had other books I was planning on doing, but I uh, decided to just go ahead and do this. And I'm very familiar with the work. I've been through it multiple times over the, the last decade. So we're going to learn hopefully a lot 
if you saw the previous installments, then hopefully you're, you're going to be already familiar with the terms. So we don't have to rehearse all of the theological terms all over again, hopefully. Um, this isn't a boomer shirt. Actually, this is a uh, fancy... Uh, what do you call these little things? These little spiral things? These little shirt amoebas? What are they called? Shirt? I call them shirt amoebas. <laughs> Paisleys? Are they called Paisleys? I'm not a boomer. Uh, I think they're called Paisleys. We'll call them shirt amoebas. Shirt germs. So we're gonna we're gonna talk John Damascus. Of course, he is uh, writing as a intersect, a famous theologian, philosopher, theologian, educator, born in 749. Excuse me, born in 676, died in 749. So a little bit prior to the Seventh Ecumenical Council in 787, which dealt with the issue of icons and the iconoclasts. And I've read. John's St. John's works on the icons. I've read all of the St. Theodore Studite works on the icons and all that. And uh, that kind of convinced me back then once I ironed out my, my theology of icons. Not that I was ever tempted with Protestantism, but uh, what it convinced me of was the connection between correct Christology and iconology. So the two, as we see, they're always related. Right? The right triadology affects the right anthropology, affects the right doctrine of uh, sacramentology, Christology. There's always a symphonia, there's always a harmony. We never have the replacement, the destruction, the removal of the human energy, the human will, the human side of things, right? This is why the incarnation is the model here. He's fully human, retains fully human will and energy, and yet at the same time, Christ is fully divine as a divine person, with an impersonal human nature. That's why Nestorius is a heretic. The human is never destroyed. It is rather deified in him and then by extension in us. So with that in mind, we know the context of St. John. Now, another aspect to St. John that's interesting that I'm going to remind everybody, if you didn't hear the, the old talk a couple years ago on the Logos and the Logi, the Logoi, Logi, Go and listen to Hidden, Hidden Metaphysics, Logos, Logi, because in that old talk, we covered uh, the first book in this installment, Fount of Knowledge, which is his writing on philosophy. So in that talk also, we covered uh, words and terms that, that we didn't know about, that were, un, that were unclear, fuzzy, Logos, and so forth. Uh, we covered the energies and all that. And in the new series that we're doing here, traditional philosophy and metaphysics series, we covered them as well. Was it episode three? I think we went through the theological terms as they arise both in scripture, the new Testament revelation by extension, some aspects of the old Testament and how they're used in the fathers. So that's how we determine our terms. We don't, we're not bound by, slavishly the definitions of those terms according to Aristotle, according to Platonus, according to Plato, according to Celsus, according to Origen, or any of those who are outside the bounds of the faith. They don't bind us to the meaning of the terms. The church defines her canon. The church defines the meanings of her terms. And she does so not arbitrarily, not through mindless speculation, not through worship of intellect, but through divine revelation. And that's what we're going to see is crucial here to John of Damascus, why he's such a seminal figure for theology and philosophy, is that he is the emblem, the means by which we demonstrate so many errors on all fronts. Not just errors with Protestants and Evangelicals or with Roman Catholics, but also errors within Orthodoxy. We have many of the pietistic strands of Orthodoxy who think philosophy is evil who think that philosophy is something that is antithetical inherently to theology. Well, St. John of Damascus wrote many, many, many theolo uh, philo philosophical works. In fact, he was working with Aristotle centuries before Aquinas. 
And not only that, we'll see that John, John Damascus is the proper use of Aristotle and philosophy, the balanced use, neither allowing it to be completely discarded as worthless and also not allowing it to be something that enslaves us to its meanings, to its Hellenic pagan contexts. There is overlap. We can find overlap between uh, uh, God being a first cause, right? Sure, sure, God is the first cause. But the first cause is not Aristotle's first cause. The first cause is I am that I am, a personal God, right? So it all, it all depends on what we mean by the terms, the context, and the referent. And that's what leads to a lot of theological confusion over the years, over the centuries, and over the millennia. We saw, of course, that he has a smaller work also called On Heresies. And what On Heresies did was that it basically summarized, in a loose sense, the term heresy, all of the false doctrines, right? So heathenism is called a heresy, paganism, heresy, uh, Gnosticism, Arianism, all the different many early church heresies. And not only that, one of those great heresies that he refutes is Marcionism. Marcionism, of course, being the heresy that we talk about often here, uh, the disjunction between the Old Testament and the New Testament, missing the proper understanding of the relationship between those two testaments, we could say. And it is, of course, accounted amongst the heresies. And I say that because we're going to see later on that in the defense of the Orthodox faith, the proper views of pretty much everything that we believe are explicated correctly. And not only is St. John kind of a pivotal figure almost in the middle of the church history period, like kind of halfway almost between the time of Christ to now, uh, so he's good for encapsulating the faith for the 800 years, 700 years prior to him. And he's a good, he's a good means for us to look back to see, uh, you know, maybe around halfway point in the history of the church, what was what was the faith? How was it summarized in the 7th, 8th century? And we're going to see that he summarizes things accurately from the time of the church fathers, from the time of the apostolic period all the way up through the councils, in the same way that we believe it now. No differences. No new systems. No importing of German idealism and Fichte and Hegel. We don't need that. No discarding of philosophy completely. We don't need that. St. John, we're going to see, does apologetics. I have had idiots in the realms of so-called orthodoxy who say, we don't do apologetics. Excuse me. Thousands of writings of church fathers about apologetics. Thousands, excuse me, thousands of pages, hundreds of writings doing apologetics. This book is apologetics. The philosophical chapters begins with a transcendental argument. Don't do apologetics. Excuse me? You have no idea what you're talking about. We're pietists. We don't do apologetics. No, that's a Protestant heresy. You have to do apologetics. It's demanded. It's commanded. From Proverbs all the way up through Paul and Acts doing apologetics. Jesus does apologetics with the Pharisees, with the scribes, with the Sadducees. He refutes the Sadducees with proof texts. He refutes the Pharisees with proof texts. Paul refutes the pagans, both citing philosophers and citing scripture. Yes, using scripture against pagans. So that's why St. John is great, is that he's not just a, an intersect on the errors within orthodoxy in the spheres of orthodoxy. And we're going to see, too, by the way, he believes in creation. He believes in the inspiration and revelation of divine scriptures, inerrancy of scriptures. He believes in tradition. He believes in all those weird things that Protestants reject. He believes all those things. And he's encapsulating accurately the centuries prior to him, the ecumenical councils prior to him. In fact, when he interprets the this, this Sixth Council, as we'll see in Book 3, He's going to show you that Christology and the essence-energy distinction in the triad 
is imported directly into Christology. Obviously, it's 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 one of the of the holy trinity that becomes incarnate. Of course, the essence energy distinction from God's relationship to the world is going to re- relate to Christ becoming incarnate. It's a it's a no brainer. But this is of course what the Thomists and the Roman Catholics they they think that. They're all over the place. They think that that St. John Damascus is teaching Thomism, even though Aquinas, in his work on simplicity, on truth, says that he rejects St. John Damascus on the essence of energy distinction. <laughs> I mean, how many times do I have to show the quotes? We're told that, that it's a different faith, and St. John was in error here. No, we're going to see that he is, in fact, not in error. It is, in fact, Aquinas and the proponents of Neoplatonic simplicity that are in error. All right, let's see. So uh, thank you for these super chats. We're going to get to those here in a second. We're always wel- always welcoming super chats. Um, let's dive in here to St. John. So now in book one, of course, we have the Ordo. Remember we talked about the Ordo Theologiae and having... The right ordo was was crucial. We don't start our theology with speculations about what an absolutely simple essence is. We don't start our our theology with the Augustinian shield. We don't start our theology with anything other than God incarnate. So he has a unique starting point that neither Protestants nor Roman Catholics typically have. He starts with the only begotten incarnate. He does not start with God as an absolutely simple super essence with super, super essence monad qualities. He says, no man has seen God at any time, but the Logos, the Son of God, has declared him. John 1 is where his well, 1 through, I guess, all the way up through 7, 14 to 17. Right? That's where he begins. John 1.18. This is a different order of theology, isn't it? Now, again, for those who don't know what we're talking about, this has nothing to do with the metaphysical priority of a doctrine. right? This is an error where we mistake logical priority or temporal priority with metaphysical priority. This is a common mistake in the history of philosophy and theology. Just because something is listed first does not mean that it has necessarily metaphysical or ontological priority. Just because something is listed first in an order of things logically does not mean necessarily that it has any ontological supremacy. For as we shall see when St. John talks about the persons, the Father is the sole arche cause and monarchia of the Godhead. He is the sole uncaused person in the Godhead. And being the only cause in the Godhead, he doesn't share that property with anyone else. That being the case, the beginning of his theology, his systematic theology, and by the way, this work shows that it's not wrong to do systematic theology. This is one of the first systematic presentations of theology, this pure theology. We could look to writings like the Catechetical Lectures of St. Cyril of Jerusalem. You've heard me reference those in the past. We reference those in response to uh, higher criticism and modernism. Right? A lot of times you'll hear the objection that systematic theology inherently is wrong. And, and the reason that medieval Roman Catholicism went off is because it was scholastic. No. Being academic, being scholastic is not the problem. The problem is the philosophical presuppositions of the scholastics, not being scholastic. And there are, of course, excesses, right, where we could go into the, the putting the sacraments under a microscope like we see in, in medieval Roman Catholicism, the Summa, and this kind of thing. And if you cough during the consecration, have you committed a mortal sin? This is ridiculous, okay? None of this in orthodoxy. A bunch of nonsense. The, the Talmudic spirit that's present in medieval Latin Roman Catholicism. No, 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 we don't want any of that. Uh, and we don't see any of that in the first millennia of the church. These are of a different spirit. 
But what we do see is a proper balance here, a proper balance of appreciation for what's true in philosophy, for being able to have insights from the realm of philosophy, but at the same time not being a slave to them. And again, when we see what the, what the origin is problematic, the problem of origin that we saw earlier, the problem of Neoplatonism, the problem of absolute simplicity, right? If we read Free Choice and Maximus Confessor, if we read God, History, and Dialectic, Volume 1, uh, if we read just St. Gregory of Palamoth and Trias, what we start to see is that we're not slaves to philosophic speculations and definitions. We allow revelation to correct, because revelation obviously has primacy over philosophic speculation. Obviously, it's a no-brainer. St. John will say that. So we begin with the idea that no one sees God. And then we, be, we, we move to the point that what we see in Romans 1, what we see in the Book of Wisdom, by the way, he cites the Book of Wisdom for doctrines, so he doesn't have the canon of the Protestants, is that no man has seen God at any time, yet God has been revealed. St. John, of course, is going to consistently throughout the entire book, not just book one, the entire work, talk about the essence-energy distinction. So this is one of the ways that the essence-energy distinction is useful in that it, it explains this claim in Scripture, that's the seeming contradiction in Scripture. How do you see God and yet no man sees God? Well, one of the reasons that we see God is that God manifests within time and space, hypostatically, in hypostatized, right? And St. John uses all these terms. I didn't make them up. They come from the councils. They come from the New Testament. They come from the fathers. Is that God can reveal himself personally to us within time and space and history. And yet there's always going to be an aspect to God because of his divine nature, because of his infinite, omnipotent power, divinity, his simplicity, that we will never know him fully. And yes, the divine nature is simple. It is uncompounded. It is not composite. We're going to see St. John teach all of these things. And we're going to see that we banish dialectical oppositional thinking when we read St. John correctly, and we don't fall into the errors of dialectical tensions in theology. That balance is everywhere present in St. John. I think that's one of the reasons for his greatness as a theologian. He says that nature does show us revelation that God exists, that there is one God. Right, and that we are guilty. Is this a, a, an abstracted natural theology? No. It's a theology where we have what might more properly be called natural revelation. And he uses the term of being revealed. And does that mean that man can be saved through this natural revelation by speculating about the natural world? No. He cites Romans 1. that it shows man is guilty because because the, the natural world reveals to us that there is one true God, that he should be worshipped, that he is holy and he's not any created thing, and that, as Paul says in Romans 1, it shows us guilt, man's guilt. Now, how is it that St. John argues that these things are true? Does he argue from the base? Does he begin his, his theology, his ordo, with Aristotle? Does he begin his order of theology with church fathers? Nope. What does he say is the, is the revelation, right? He says revelation is where we get this from. Does he say it's speculations from Aristotle? Does he say it's a great synthesis between the Greeks and the Jews, no. He says in the very first chapter that the revelation, which is the basis, he's not talking about natural revelation, now he's talking about special revelation, right? Scripture, divine revelation. It's the Old Testament in perfect continuity with the New Testament and tradition. The ancient bounds of the divine tradition. That we see this is different from many, many, many theologies. Pick up a Latin medieval scholastic theology. Does it function in this mode? Does it go in this flow? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. 
So that's chapter one. That's how we begin. We begin with incarnation and by extension, triadology, what's revealed in the incarnation and in the divine scriptures. We do not begin with Aristotle's metaphysics. We do not begin with Plato's Republic. We do not begin with an equality or a comparison religion approach to how all the religions have uh, something common about them. We don't do natural theology here. We're not doing that. We have the idea of revelation in nature. We have the idea of revelation in the scriptures. We have the, the statement that the law, the Old Testament, is good, and the prophets, and that they are in perfect harmony with the apostles and evangelists of the New Covenant. We know that nature shows us order, harmony, and divine providence. If there was not order, harmony, meaning, and divine providence in nature, there would not be a single creator. But there is, and therefore this shows us there is a God, there is a creator. However, that's not enough. It's not enough to save us. It's not enough to, 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 we can't philosophically speculate back to the perfect super essence. No, because we need revelation. And revelation is not just something that we need to be saved. Revelation is needed to interpret the natural world. Because the natural world, as St. Maximus says, is also revelation. It is divine revelation. How is that so? Because of the divine, because of the logoi, the logi, right? The created world is bound up and patterned essentially on the archetypes in the logos. They are, there are many archetypes, many patterns and principles, exemplars, the logi, and they are all one in the logos. And guess what? St. John Damascus teaches that very thing, just like St. Saint, Saint Maximus taught. So as we move into the next section, we have discussions of divine economy. So God didn't just reveal his existence to us. We didn't just see it in nature and arguments in scripture. We also see the divine dispensation or the economy. Now, sometimes the economy is used in different sense. But here we're speaking of the time when Christ becoming became incarnate. So this is when, this is this is not just God in, in relation to the world, but God incarnate. And this is all almost always referred to in the economia or the economy. This is going to play into when we talk about God in terms of the triad, right? We're gonna we're gonna know and we're gonna see even here in St. John, right, of these those three levels that we talked about. The or the the in God. This is, this is not God in relationship to the world. This is God in relationship just considered in himself. Okay, And this is a distinctive of Orthodox theology. We have we have this is this is just economia in terms of God in relationship to the world, right? But to be more specific so that we don't get confused, when we analyze God in theology, in all the Eastern tradition, we speak of the persons and their hypostatic origin, their, per their hypostatic properties, right? This is how we distinguish the persons in the Trinity. We do not believe that the medieval Latin conception of relations of opposition is a sufficient means to distinguish the persons. In fact, it confuses them. Opposition is a term of dialectics. Dialectics only makes sense in a dyad. We do not believe in a dyad. There's no such thing as dialectics in God. There's no such thing as trialectics in God. There's not oppositional categories in God. There are not merely relations of opposition. There are hypostatic properties or relations of origin. That's why the second person of the Trinity doesn't take on the uh, property of the Father of being the sole cause, the sole arche. The second level, of course, is energetic manifestation. We're going to see that St. John talks about that. When he speaks of the Son, he, sp he says it with the sp in, in relationship to the Spirit, it is specifically as the manifester of the Spirit. And then he goes on to talk about the economy. 
Jesus sending the Spirit into time and space, right? Now, in Roman Catholicism, this is all smushed together and confused. It all becomes one big thing. Sometimes they make the distinction. Sometimes they don't, right? It's confused. If you read the Vatican clarification on the filioque, which I've referenced many times the last couple weeks, you will see that it admits all of these distinctions. It says, yes, okay, this is true. Um, And it ends that section of talking about these distinctions by saying, that is the Greek, Greek and Eastern and Orthodox tradition, and it does look like there are some difficulties in, in trying to meld these two traditions. <laughs> Correct, exactly, because they don't meld. Because if you believe in the essence energy distinction, you have an explanation for why there's a difference between God creating the world and God's other attributes. If you don't believe in the essence energy distinction, as John Damascus will show us, you have to believe that essentially the generation of the sun is no different than the creation of the world. And we'll see that in a minute where he will even touch on that topic. So when we talk about economia, we are talking about essentially the dispensation, not dispensationalism, the dispensation of God within history after the incarnation. St. John speaks about God uh, in terms of the anthropomorphic terms. This is a basic Reddit Reddit atheist mistake. Uh, When we speak of God as sleeping, as angry, as vengeful, as indifferent, as having hands, eyes, feet, the eyes of the Lord, you know, seek through throughout the earth, who is humble and so forth. These these are called anthropomorphisms. They're not intended to literally mean that God has eyes, hands, feet, and so forth. God, we know then, he says, is a singular God. But the singular God is not a God of philosophic speculation. He is a personal God. And this is important too. This is why this is another key aspect that sets our religion over against all other essentialist and impersonalist philosophies. Greek Hellenism, as we saw in the many talks we've already done, it's characterized by impersonal forces, evolution, Gnosticism, impersonal forces dominating, right? Because this world is the abortion of the demiurge or whatever. In Darwinism, we saw in the last talk for subscribers, it was based on Gnosticism. It was based on Milton and the anti-Trinitarian thought of his time, the rationalistic, deistic thought of his time. So this is crucial to understand that our God is not just generic being. He's not at the, he's not at the top of a chain of being. That's medieval and that's Hellenic. We don't believe that. That's in fact rejected. Plato is rejected. Our God is in fact personal. Right? And this is one of the key categories that sets our religion over against all the other religions because the other religions teach that there's an absolutely simple essence that all things derive from, that are split from. There was some platonic schism or something like this, right? Whether it's Islam or whether it's most forms of Judaism, whether it's Hinduism, you got to dissolve into the absolute and nirvana. They're all based on this, the impersonal one. They even, in their philosophy, it's this, right? It's the point within the circle, the sun image, the Pythagorean dot starting point, the monad, okay? We don't believe that. And the fact that because we talk about a one, right? We saw this before. What does Basil say? The one is not an it. The one is makes all the difference in the world. When Father Staniloy writes Orthodox Dogmatics, Volume 1, he hammers this home countless times. Countless times in the book he hammers this point home. Countless times he says this sets us off against most of the world religions. That means, and by extension, the essence energy distinction flows directly from this doctrine. That means that our religion is unique. And it's part of the reason why we can't blend it with philosophic perennialism. Uh, I was just watching a clip of James Custinger, the so-called Orthodox. He's not, but 
I think he claims to be influenced by it or something. He says, Jesus is the second person of the Godhead. And since Jesus is the second person of the Godhead, the Logos, he can never be within time and space in a single human body, single human nature. It's impossible for an absolutely simple being to manifest within time and space. And so he says, Nestorius, essentially, got it more correct. He's, he's reflecting, evidencing Nestorianism. Jesus is a historic time and space guy. How can a, a, an absolutely simple deity beyond any singular conception manifest within time and space? Well, if you believe in absolute simplicity, he can't. Right? This is why, again, we would have to have the Trinity, the entire Godhead, <laughs> becoming incarnate. But no, it in fact, because absolute simplicity is not true, it is possible for one hypostasis to enter into a mode of being that the other two do not. And that, again, is one of the crucial, key, obvious arguments why our theology is correct. So we speak of then personal properties. He, 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 will, he will go into this uh, more fully as the work continues, but personal properties is the way that we distinguish the persons in the Trinity. And so we have the Father as soul, cause, and arche, or monarchia. Right? When he defines what the Father is, as he progresses here. He's going to use these terms that are essentially the same. And he's going to, he's going to conclude book one by saying the Father alone is the sole cause. Did, did you hear me? The Father alone is the sole cause. That means that causation, existence, as it comes to be eternally in God, is immediately personal it is not essential it is i mean in the sense of it being essentialism it is not impersonal it is not hypo, it is not the augustinian shield okay the augustinian shield begins by talking about the unity of god according to a common essence god is one because of a common essence this is a different approach to trinity this is a different approach where we don't begin with the common essence of the Godhead, right? Creation is not a springing forth of the common essence of God. It's a personal act, creation is, of the Father, through the Son, and in the Spirit. Now, what's interesting is that the medieval theologians in the West were wrong. And the Vatican clarification admits that this got obscured. And they say, well... Yeah, we should have been more clear because the, the Father is the principal source and an RK in the Godhead. But the, but the Son also is a co-cause with him, a secondary co-cause. The Father is kind of the top cause, but then the, the Son is kind of like a second. He's a co-cause with the Father of the Spirit. No, no, no. Because as we're going to see in St. John, the, the personal property of the Father is to be the sole cause. Soul means soul. It doesn't mean half. Jesus is not half the cause of the spirit. He's not three. He doesn't. He doesn't give. He doesn't give aspects of the spirit to the to the. To, he doesn't give aspects of the existence of the spirit to the spirit of the Father. It gives other things. All this confusion. No. The Father is the sole arche, the sole cause, the sole monarchia of the Godhead. And that's why creation, then, is not a springing forth of something impersonal or essential, but rather personal. All of reality is at fundamental, at a fundamental level, personal. It's not a chain of being. Okay, being is this generic concept, this generic notion of existence. I'm not saying that there, we can't talk about being. It's fine to talk about being. God is not a classification of the many beings that are out there at the top of a pyramid of beings. 
because he is absolutely completely different from all of the beings in this world. There are aspects to which we can find analogia, analogy to the being of God, but they are not to God in himself. They are only to God's re revelation, God's energies towards creation. That's what St. John's going to say countless times in book one, over and over and over. So in other words, when he talks about soul cause, when he talks about the uh, God, the Father being the Arche, when he talks about him being the unoriginate, when he talks about him being the monarchia of the Godhead, they're all essentially saying and describing the same reality of the hypostasis of the Father. All right, so we'll, we'll put him there. And from him all Godhead springs, all life springs. All right. So what's our starting point? Is our starting point, there's the, the common essence of God? No. No, it's not. It's Father. For us, there is one God, the common essence. No, 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 that's not what the Creed says. For us, there is one God, the Father Almighty. Paul says, St. Paul says very clearly in his epistles, for us, there is one God, the Father of Jesus Christ. Now, if you've read the Eastern Fathers, I've read all the theological orations. I've read almost all of St. Basil. I've read almost all of uh, St. Gregor N uh, Nys Nyssa. Um, I've read um, a lot of St. John Chrysostom, not everything, because he's got voluminous commentaries. Um, but the, har the, the hardcore theology, um, I've read most of that in the Eastern Fathers. And what we understand is this principle. Now you say, so what? That's just the Eastern Fathers. Yeah, but the Eastern Fathers theology is what comes to dominate those councils that deal with this. Okay, So the majority of the philosophic, educated, theological discussion that goes on in the empire, and when the emperors call the ecumenical councils, it's as a result of fathers working from that Eastern tradition. Right. St. Cyril of Alexandria refuting Nestorius. St. Athanasius refuting Arius. Right. St. John of Damascus refuting the iconoclasts. St. Maximus re refuting Pyrrhus and the monothelites. St. Justinian, the emperor, refuting Origen. So what we see is, is we've got we got to have this in mind. And we have to understand this in distinction to this notion of what dominates the medieval Roman Catholic conception I'm drawing a quick Augustinian shield here for you I guess I could have just got one offline, but but you, you, you know the idea. I'm sure you've seen it, right? And I've been in Catholic cathedrals, and you'll see this kind of in the walls or in the architecture. God is Holy Spirit. God is Son. God is Father. And then in the circular part, it'll say is not. The Son is not the Father. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Son, right? This is the Augustinian shield. This is not correct. We, we don't follow this because we don't begin the, the theology with the unicity of the simplicity of God. Because this model, this mode here is based on absolute divine simplicity in its reasoning. It is not father as soul RK. Could it be reformulated and put into a, a coherent form? Not really. Because generally speaking, it's also used to try to defend filioque. But, but again, it's a, it's a modalistic scheme because... Again, who is God? God is the common essence of these persons. It doesn't begin like the creed does and like all of the councils do by talking about God as the Father, as the sole arche cause and unoriginate beginning of the Godhead. Now you say, as all the, the Roman Catholics have said, who have not read any of these Eastern Fathers and don't know that this is in the Eastern Councils and don't even pay attention to their own creed that says that the Father is the beginning of Godhead, they will say... You can't import cause into God. That's Aristotle. <laughs> John Damascus does it about 20 times <laughs> in the work. 
Uh, what is the what is the great quote of uh, Saint Gregory Nazianzus from the Orations? All things that the Father has belong to the Son, except being the cause. Okay, except causality. Causality, from the time of the, East, the beginning of the Church all the way up through, is always used of the person of the Father. And the specific explanation is given that it's not the same as causality within time and space. Okay, and this is the error that every Thomist and every Roman Catholic theologian says. If you remember the debate with Dr. Feingold, he was tripped up by this. He couldn't believe that I was saying that the Father is the cause. That's crazy. Even their own Vatican clarification on the Filioque says the Father's the cause. <laughs> uh, John of Damascus ends this whole book by saying that the Father alone is the sole cause. Okay, And this is what protects us from the importation of generic being and impersonalism and dialectics into God. We don't want any of that in God. Because our doctrine is on the basis of revelation, not Hellenic speculation. The councils base it on scripture and revelation. And they don't confuse the persons in the Godhead. Because when you confuse the persons in the Godhead, when you confuse their hypostatic properties, when you, confuse, when you give the Son a partial role in the Father being the sole cause, then what happens is you get imbalance and you get the Father and the Son sharing a property that the Son does not, that the Spirit does not. So, the old age old adage that everything that God has, the fathers, or the, 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 the persons possess in common, right, according to nature, except for the personal properties, that gets removed. The father and the son now share a special property of being co causes, a co cause, a singular co cause of the person of the spirit. There's only one cause and origin in the Godhead, and that's the person of the Father. And when we confuse them in that role, well, guess what? The other situations confuse, right? We get confusion between the origins of God in terms of his proper theology and the economy. And this is in the Roman Catholics rush to trying to quote verses about Christ sending the Spirit within time and space and history, and then they try to read back into that hypostatic origin. And even Roman Catholic theologians admit that doesn't work. Vatican clarification admits that doesn't work. Nobody denies that Jesus spent, sends the Spirit in terms of the economia. And St. John Damascus makes all these distinctions in Book 1 and he makes it very clear. So we want to start there and we want to point that out. And we want to also note that when we speak of God revealing himself as personal, it's not equated with human persons. Do you remember all of those explanations of the terms and analogies that I gave two episodes back? He does all that. He does all the same things. He talks about nature and person. Right? And it's the famous quote of St. John Damascus that all heresies arise from the confusing of nature and person. Right? From Catholicism, Calvinism, they confuse nature and person. So they don't make these distinctions that are necessary for theology. And as a result, the theology gets all muddled, and they end up with perennialism at Vatican II. Well, why not? I mean, if all the religions are essentially teaching the same thing, like Kustinger says, like Ratzinger says in Introduction to Christianity, then they really don't really lead us to anything unique in Catholicism or Christianity, do they? Christianity is one of the many forms that come along. And that's why you see them saying Declaration on Religious Liberty, right? That's why you see them saying Islam, Judaism, they're just different pathways. You can be saved in all the religions. All the religions are just interchangeable forms and symbols. And this is absolutely what Vatican II says. I don't care about the fact that, well, in another place it says something correct. This is the double mind that they always do. They always will say, yeah, but, but that might be a problematic statement. But over here, there's a good statement. You're just being manipulated. That's the, the classic Vatican bureaucraties to throw a bone to the traditionalists here and there, to throw a bone in the documents of Vatican II to the people who want to retain it. That's just to keep you there, dude. Now we know then that God exists. There's no doubting that God exists, he says. Well, that's interesting. So that would, that would suggest that 
we're not doing the apologetics of uh, uh, it's 99% true, it's 80% certain that God exists. <laughs> he says there's no doubt that God exists. And he says that we know that God exists from the scriptures. So here we have not the natural theology type of argumentation, but the certitude of God's existence based on revelation. This is much more in line with presuppositional apologetics, and that's why you will see, again, in the philosophic chapters, uh, Fount of Knowledge, right? Philosophic chapters, what did he do? He did a transcendental argument. Does Aquinas do a transcendental argument? No, he does not, because it conflicts with the classical foundationalist epistemology of Thomism, right? But St. John Damascus has a different epistemology and a different theology, and therefore he can do a transcendental argument. Aquinas does not. We see then that re not only revelation testifies to God's existence, and not only is revelation inspired, not only is it true, but we, we see that God is personal as the first cause. God is a first cause. Cause, that's fine. We don't care about, there's no problem in using that term. But that cause is not an impersonal abstract idea. That, that cause is not thought thinking itself. That first cause is not a first in a chain of infinite regress. Some, somehow we're supposed to stop at a certain infinite regress. Uh, should we stop at an inf infinite regress? Yes, we should. But because of the fact that it's revealed to us that we should, not because we can come up with some obtuse speculation that actually doesn't work. Because we don't begin our theology with autonomous reasoning, but with revelation. And that's exactly what St. John Damascus does. He begins his theology by saying, we know this from the inspired scriptures given to the church in Revelation in both the Old and New Testament. And we also know that God exists because of what has been revealed through nature. And what does that revelation do? It causes us to stand guilty for not believing in and worshiping God. Now we see purpose in nature. We see telos in nature. These are all proper uses of the terminologies of Aristotle. They're also used at times in Scripture. That's fine. No problem there. But again, if you read the Summa Contra Gentiles, which I read, does Aquinas begin his theology with revelation? No. No, volume one is Aristotle and first cause arguments from natural theology. The special revelation theology is tacked on afterwards. <laughs> now you say, well, so what? Is that not just a... Uh, uh, a difference of logical priority and not metaphysical priority? No. We are we are arguing that the Catholic scheme here, particularly the medieval Catholic scheme and what becomes dogmatized eventually in Roman Catholicism, so it's not just a question of Thomas's opinions. What what becomes eventually dogmatized is not just the logical priority but the metaphysical priority of these ideas. Being right, is given a logical and metaphysical priority in that theology. But we don't have a common, clear idea of what being is. It's not something that is common to the believer and the unbeliever automatically. We can talk about being. We can talk about existence. But again, being and existence or something like this, they have completely different meanings for a believer. to If I believe that what exists is good and that it possesses a, the quality of being... That's all well and good, but I believe that it's created being. An unbeliever does not. So at a fundamental level, being is completely different in its context than what we believe. Does that mean that we can't do apologetics? Of course not. I do it all the time. Does that mean we can never use evidences? Of course not. But they have to be understood in their context, within their web of beliefs, within their paradigm. Okay. So being, causality... Right? These are the other problems in this. Telos. Right? These terms, they don't operate on their own. They're not terms that operate magically, metaphysically, that just sort of import themselves into our minds. They only make sense within a context of a worldview within a totality belief system, within a paradigm, okay? 
So for us, causality in the world, it's not an impersonal force. It is immediately and directly personal because all causality begins not with some unknown generic essence, not some common essence, but with the person of the Father, through the Son, and in the Spirit. So the fundamental structure, origin, meaning, end of being is Trinitarian and personal. You see, being for us is personal in its origins, in its sustenance, in its time and space relations, the logi, its pattern, its archetype, its ends, its purpose, alpha omega, right? Not an impersonal force, not a generic being, not a generic causality, right? These terms only make sense within an overall worldview and paradigm. Now, does that mean that an unbeliever can't get things right? That he can't talk about being in some way that's insightful? Of course not. Why? Because he doesn't live in a different world. He lives in God's world. Right? So the flaws, the errors, are not in the terms, not in the meanings, but in his worldview. In his worldview, he's got conflicting systems of thought going on at once. There's the mind of the unbeliever. We'll put it right here. Here's this guy, here's his mind. He sees this world as operating in an impersonal way, right? These forces, these categories, right? He thinks they just mean what they mean automatically to him. They, the, the, the autonomous mind of man can, can interpret these things without starting with God, without taking into account the fall. But you can't reason about those things without presupposing God and without taking into account the fall, can you? And we saw that in the last talk about Darwinism, didn't we? We saw that Darwin and all the Victorian philosophers and natural scientists did not believe in the fall. And so they looked at the world and they said, this is a messed up world. It's got predators and prey. It's got death everywhere. Uh, therefore, death is just as natural as life. So they reasoned about the world, the natural world, without revelation, as if it was governed by impersonal forces and not a personal God. They did not believe in the immediate presence of God within the natural world because absolute simplicity had banished him from his eminence through the uncreated energies. They did not believe that the external world had its origins and its meaning, the particulars in the Logi, the exemplars that are uncreated. And they didn't believe that it had any telos or, or purpose out there within the world ultimately summed up in God. So they reasoned about the world in their vain speculations, Paul says in Romans 1, outside of Revelation, outside of the fall, and outside of a personal God. You cannot get creation correct by speculation and philosophic reasoning. You, revelation tells us the world is created by faith. We know that the worlds were created ex nihilo, Hebrews, Hebrews says, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It doesn't say by natural speculation. It says by faith. In other words, creation is a revealed doctrine. That's why none of the pagans can figure it out because they don't have revelation and they don't take into account the fall of man. So the world that we see now is not how it was originally. But you can't figure that out if you don't believe in a fall. You can't do anthropology correctly if you don't believe in a fall. So this is one of the reasons why natural theology doesn't work in the Thomistic view. Again, read uh, Father St. Eloy's Volume 1. It explains why we don't believe in natural theology. Do you see then that the conceptions of Hellenism and what use philosophy has and doesn't have are going to be determined by the rest of the theology that we have? See? What we mean by first cause, what we mean by telos, what we mean by being, what we mean by any of these terms, person, nature, they come from revelation, they come from the deposit of faith, they come from the councils, they don't come principally through those outside the faith. There can be insights, there can be advances in sciences, there can be advances in philosophy and all kinds of things. But 
if you don't believe in a personal creator, in the Trinity, in Revelation, in creation, in the fall, and that creation is moving towards a telos, a purpose, an end, there's no way you can get the paradigm right. So you won't have the correct paradigm. You'll have an incorrect paradigm with a bunch of errors and inconsistencies. And that's why we do paradigm apologetics, presuppositional apologetics, transcendental apologetics. That's why St. John Damascus does a transcendental argument in the beginning of his philosophic work. So we see then that the first cause is a personal creator. The world has its telos, its purpose, its origin uh, there within the world. It's fine to talk about those Aristotelian terms there with the five causes, the material, the efficient, the final, et cetera, et cetera. That's all fine. We don't have a problem with that uh, as long as we're not slaves to those terms. Right? So when we talked about the Father as the sole cause, this is, if you read Athanasius against the Arians, he says, the Arians are tripped up because we talk of the Father as the cause and we talk of begetting. And they say begetting is a time-space relationship. And if you read that into God, then God is no longer simple. There's, diff there's real distinctions in God. And therefore the Son, if, if God is simple and God is the Father, and the fatherhood is simple in God, then the, then, the, then the Son has to be subordinate. Because to have a real distinction in God would mean that, that God is composite. So, yes, the Arians and Origen, on the basis of divine simplicity and the Eunomians, that's the basis for why the Son is subordinate. Because if he's different, if there's any real distinctions between the Father and the Son, then he's subordinate. But there is a real distinction between the Father and the Son. And the solution is what the Eastern Fathers teach, is to say that the time-space relations, we don't read those back into God. The time-space relations have their origins from God, right? Not the other way around. They're, they're ana analogous. It's fine to talk about an analogia in that way. But it's, it's, it's never perfectly right. And St. John says that. He says that when we use the divine names, and he cites St. Dionysios over and over and over, the Areopagite, he says that they, th these names never perfectly match up. And if we were to, to read a generation back into into the Godhead according to human relations in a strict way, in an equivalent way, right? Equivalence, equivocation, then we would end up in craziness, madness, right? But we don't do that. So the created order, he says, is, is not chance and is not chaos. If we believe that there's many gods, then we are led to the conclusion that what reigns is not divine providence and all things are not related in a coherent fashion but rather it is chaos and chance that reign and ultimately fate again i've made this argument many times this refutes the goofus pagans everywhere that are rising up with systematic support from the establishment you're being you're being taken into the pagan camp of goofiness on purpose and you, all you pagan idiots out there that constantly invade the chat and all this nonsense you're you just wait just wait, you're being taken for a ride. Now, God is invisible. God is not composed of parts. God is simple. God is a first cause, but he is not an absolutely simple divine essence. Right? He says that if, instead, if we use the divine names, according to St. Dionysius, we can begin to speak of and name God. Now, I did, we, we did a whole talk on that. Go listen to the talk on the divine names. What did we see that St. Dionysius taught? Well, he teaches the essence energy distinction. He teaches the logos and the logi doctrine. He teaches uncreated energies. He teaches all the things that we teach. So again, no, not doesn't afford the Roman Catholic any place to argue because there's a consistent teaching from Dionysius to St. Basil, right? To, Ath well, to, Ath to Dionysius, to Athanasius, to Basil, uh, to St. Cyril of Alexandria, uh, to St. Maximus, to St. John. It's not happenstance that they're teaching these doctrines. It's not happenstance that they all teach the essence energy distinction. It's not a theological opinion that's just academic. Being is not synonymous with God. And the reason that being, this is chapter 4 and 5, the being is not synonymous with God because any of the terms that we use about God uh, do not match up to his essence. Right? 
So this is the apophatic way of speaking of God, the via negativa. I'm sure we all are familiar with this. Roman Catholics even claim to believe this. If they understood that it, it doesn't make sense in absolute divine simplicity, they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't believe in absolute divine simplicity. But uh, St. John says that, that the way that we name God is from his energies, from his operations within nature. Okay, so that's chapter 4. He mentions the energies there. He says, when we speak of God, we do not speak of his essence, but we speak of the energies that are proper to him. His justice, his wisdom, his goodness, the attributes, the acts, those are energies. All right, that's chapter 4. But that doesn't mean that there's one, that there's more than one God. When we speak of God's justice, when we speak of God's mercy, those aren't different gods. There's only one God. And what does he cite for that? He cites the Shema. What? Yes. So he's not a Marcionite, is he? The Shema of Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. The Shema. We believe the Shema. We believe the Tetragrammaton. I am that I am. I am that I am is the God who is. Now, the God who is, is that a statement of philosophic being, gener generic being categories? It is not. I am that I am. I. It's personal. The being of the world is not the same as the being of God. Can we name God as the greatest being, the highest being? Sure. And he says that. But he says that's a name of God's operation, not of his essence. Energy, same term. We do not speak of a duality in God. We do not believe in many gods. The fact that God has many powers does not mean that there are many gods, but rather there is one energy in God. Why does he say there's one energy in God? Does that prove uh, Taylor Marshall correct that, that uh, there's not a dis distinction between the essence and energy? Of course not. Of course not. And if Taylor Marshall had actually read the book, he would know that. But he didn't. He just pretexted and cut that, cut and copied and pasted that out, which we showed already in previous talks multiple times that St. John Damascus says both things. Now, why would he say there's one energy? Well, there's one energy in God because there's one source, one nature, and one power. Right. So this is to counteract the idea that the, that the son has a different energy from the father or that the spirit has a different energy than the son or the, or the father. Right. In other words, if there was different energies, there would be different wills in God. But there's not one. Uh, there's, there, there's not multiple wills in God. There's one will in God. There's one will in God because there's one power in God because there's one energy in God. So every act of God. Right is common to the Godhead. However, we also believe in the reality of one of the persons being able to enter into a mode of being that the others do not. And this is how it's possible that there's an incarnation. So in other words, we can't stress this to the extent that the entire Godhead becomes incarnate. They don't. One of these persons can enter into a different mode of being, as St. Maximus says, than the other two. That's why the Father did not become incarnate. The Holy Spirit did not become incarnate. The Son became incarnate. And the Son's divine power, energy, will, and source was the Father. Right? And that power, energy, and will was common because it's, it's communicated from the Father to, uh, through the Son and the Spirit. And this is what St. John says. St. John says here in chapter 6 that, that nature never exists in the abstract. Right? The divine nature doesn't exist in some abstract. The divine energies do not exist in an abstract. Christ did not 
exist in an abstract. They are always, nature is always in hypostatized, in the mode of persons. Nature is always in hypostatized, in the mode of persons. This is one, another reason why we can't start with reasoning about God through his essence. Because we don't approach God's essence. We don't, we don't come to God through his essence. We come to God first as father, as personal, as hypostatic. And he in, in hypostatizes his nature, you see. If this is strange to you, it is because of your ignorance, if you are a so-called Christian or a so-called Catholic or whatever. This is the entire basis that St. Cyril uses to refute Nestorius. And if you read McGuckin's book, or if you read St. Cyril's writings, which I've read against Nestorius, you'll see that when he bases his argument for in hypostatization of nature, it's on the basis of the Godhead, the relations in the Godhead, the personal hypostatic relations. It's on the basis of God revealed as Father through Son in Spirit. In that triadic way, and as God and and from God as personal first and foremost. That's why Jesus is not an addition formula. He's an eternal divine person in an impersonal human nature. Do you understand that? Do you understand the import of that? I don't think you do, because if you did, you would agree with us. The theology of the triad is directly what, what affects and proves the doctrine of the Incarnation. The doctrines of person, will, attribute, nature, energy in the triad directly flow into the doctrine of person, will, energy, two natures, two energies, two wills in the incarnation. If you read St. Cyril versus Nestorius about being about nature being hypostatized, you will learn this. You will not be confused and mystified when I say that in St. John of Damascus's book, the movement of essence energy from book one about God and triad all the way up through to book three in the incarnation about energy, will, essence, hypostasis, it's the same arguments. And they're based on one another. Do you see this? That's why you can't come up with a different theology of person, will, nature, essence, distinction, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and have the right incarnation doctrine, and have the right doctrine of diothelitism. So every time I've argued with a Roman Catholic on Twitter, about this, they say, when St. John Damascus talks about essence energy in book one, it has nothing to do with essence energy in book three. Yes, it does. You have no idea what you're talking about. If you were to read this, you would figure that out. So, let's move on here in St. John. We're starting to, hopefully, we get some familiarity with the terms. It's not, it's not foreign to us anymore, hopefully. Do we remember? Essence answers the question of what that thing is. Person answers the question of who that thing is. Energy operation answers the question of what it's doing. And St. John Damascus says these analogies that we speak of in the human realm, they can be applied to understand God. Going back to St. Gregory of Nyssa, right? Person, nature, will, act. Same thing. From the human realm, we can make analogies to the divine. God is not without a word. God has a logos, and that logos is in hypostatized, he says in chapter 6. It is personal. He says, our speech, right? This is another analogy from human reasoning, logic, logos, speech, word. It manifests the meaning that's in our mind, right? The conception that's in our mind of a thing that we give meaning to, we speak, 
and it conveys truth. It conveys meaning to other minds. The reality of all the world is meaning. It is that eternal speech and word. That's, this is the doctrine of the logos and the logi. The word that is your meaning, the word that is the meaning of that thing over there, right? The pattern, the archetype, the principles of every created thing are in the logos. And the many logi, the many patterns, the many exemplars, they're one in the logos. They're not the same as the divine essence either, by the way. This one father eternally begets his word. The temporal relations of begetting father and son are not applicable to the eternal begetting of the father to the son outside of time and space. It's an eternal beginning right what's the creed say eternally begotten of the father there is however in god one one power one will one operation one word who manifests the father they are not temporal relations they are eternal he says and then he goes on to say that There's one will. Creation is not be eternally begotten. It's not the same as the Son. And the Arians, because of their doctrine of divine simplicity, he says, they argued that if the Father is simple and he is the one, then they argued that if the sun is distinct and he's generated, then he's no different than creation. Because to have any real distinctions in God, to have any real distinctions in God is to posit that God is composed. This is the Arian argument. So the Father is simple and he is the oneness of God. Nature and person are confused. And since God is simple, the act of willing the creation of the world is a distinct act from God's own nature. Right? And since it's distinct, the act of generating the sun also is the same as creation. This is the Arian reasoning here. Do you see this? Well, if creation is an act of God's will and is distinct then the son also, if he's distinct, must be an act of will. And therefore, he's different or subordinate to the father because he's not the same as the father. The father's unoriginate. Therefore, the son had to have some kind of origin within history, time, and space, or whatever. The aeons past, it doesn't matter. So the son is therefore a creation, a subordinate being. Why? Because of simplicity. Now, if you've not read Athanasius, if you've not read the works that we talked about, you wouldn't know that that's because of divine simplicity. You wouldn't know it's the exact same argument that, that, that Origen makes about why the, subon is, the son is subordinated. The son is subordinated because of his doctrine of simplicity. If the act of creating the world is the same as the divine essence, right? Let's, maybe we can try to solve the Arian conception in a reverse way let's say all right we're, we're not going to believe arianism they're heretics so we're going to we're going to believe in absolute divine simplicity in a Thomistic way and we're going to say that that the absolutely simple essence of god is father and son and spirit spirated from them from them both i'm trying to draw in reverse it's hard to do How can we retain absolute divine simplicity against origin? Because origin's arguments seem to, to fall back into this. Well, let's go back to our Augustinian shield. The Latin view, especially at the Middle Ages.
let's let's say that here's our our Augustinian shield doctrine. All right, we're going to say that the act of creating the world is synonymous with the divine essence. We covered this last time, remember? The act of creating the world is exactly the same as the divine essence. This is what Thomas says. This is the meaning of actus purus. God is pure act, no potentiality, no distinctions between any of his attributes, essence, or action. They're all synonymous with the divine, uh, divine essence. And we're going to say this to try to, to try to salvage the doctrine of simplicity from the Arian objection. Okay? So we think this will maybe save it, but there's a problem with this. Because if the act of creating the world is exactly the same as the divine essence, then the act of creating the world is eternal, immutable, unchangeable, never-ending. You see, therefore, it wasn't freely done. It was coterminous with the divine essence. So God was always creating the world <laughs> eternally. He was forever created, and it's coterminous, right? Because it's created on the basis of reflections in the divine essence. Because all creatures basically come to be on the basis of what they are in the divine essence, right? So they don't have exemplars as uncreated energies that have them identified with the divine essence. But the act of creating the world by God is not the same thing as the divine essence because creation didn't have to come to be. The act of creating the world is not synonymous with fatherhood. Right? This was Origen's argument. Origen said if God is father and the essence of God is the father, then the father had to always have a creation over which he was father and Lord. And so either creation is eternal or it's in time and space. And if he's the father of the son, then the son is either eternal with creation or the son comes to be within time and space. You see, this is why a lot of people don't know this. Arianism is based on absolute divine simplicity. Eunomianism is based on absolute divine simplicity. There's a vast work by the Eunomians that Saint Gregory, against the Eunomians that St. Gregory of Nyssa did. He did the same thing in refuting the same error. And the Eunomians said they were a radical version of Arian. They said, we know what absolute divine simplicity is. We believe in it. We just don't believe that you can define this essence, except for saying that it's unoriginate. In other words, the Father, right? The Father is the unoriginate. He's the uncaused, according to our tradition. So the Eunomians said that here's God, here's the divine essence. The divine essence is defined as unoriginate, and we know what it is. So they rejected apophatic theology. They rejected the essence-energy distinction. They just simply said that we know what God is. He's an absolutely simple essence, and his essence is defined as unoriginate. It is definitional. There's a definitional sense to simplicity, and you can call him Father if you want, but Father is just the same thing as unoriginate. The divine essence, God is the Father. The divine essence is unoriginate. Equal, equal, equal. Absolute simplicity. Eunomians. The Eunomians therefore argued, since this is true, since nature and person are exactly the same, the fatherhood, the personhood is exactly the same as the simple essence. Nature and person are exactly identical here. There can be no distinctions in God that are real. Therefore, if there's a son, the son is therefore a work of God. He's an energy. Eunomia said. When St. Gregory refutes him, does he say, no, there's no essence energy distinction. We believe in absolute simplicity with you. No. He says the sun is not an energy. The sun is a person. And he shares the same power and energy. So he believes in the essence energy distinction. Goofus is. 
who haven't even actually read the work. But what do we expect, right? Can we expect Roman Catholics to actually read through? Apparently not. They're not going to read the 800-page reputation of Eunomius. They're not going to read... This isn't even that many pages. How many pages is on the Orthodox faith? 200, 300, 250? From page 165 to 250, something like that. No, too lazy. Why well, read all that when you can just go to Catholic Answers and get a uh, cut and paste job from the Church Fathers, right? But, but you see, who else is taking you work by work through these things? Who else is doing this? Where are all the other Orthodox people doing this? Why aren't there hundreds of Orthodox people making videos taking you through the Church Fathers? What? I mean, a lot of people like to talk about how much of a jerk I am, how much of a villain I am, how piece of crap I am all day long. Well, why aren't you doing this? Where's everybody else doing this? Why aren't they taking you work by work by work by work by work? Why am I the only one doing this? Where is everybody? Where are the, I mean, there are other, obviously, priests who do lectures and talks. I'm not saying that. I'm speaking of all these other people out there talking smack endlessly. I don't see you doing any of this. I don't see any evidence that you've read any of these works. I mean, I've put 10 years just into the Essence Energy Distinction question. I've read all the major works that I'm aware of. Where are you on this? <laughs> Where are your talks on the Aeneids? Where are your talks on Aristotle? Where are your talks on metaphysics? Where are your talks on the entirety of Plato's Republic and the dialogues? Where are your talks on tragedy? You know, where are your talks on any of this? St. Maximus. Why Nobody's doing talks on St. Maximus. Where are they? Where are your talks on Origen? Where are your talks on Darwin? Where are your talks on Lasky? Where are your talks on the triads? All these crucial documents for Orthodox theology? Where are all you people? <laughs> are you too pious to do apologetics? When we come to then, and I'm not, and I'm saying that because there are countless capable people out there. I'm not saying that to tout my awesomeness. I'm saying there are plenty of people who could be doing this same thing and aiding in this battle. You, you, there should be hundreds of people doing this every day. We would conquer the whole world if, if we had hundreds of people doing this every day. Again, so the arguments that we were just doing with all this stuff about eunomians and Arians and simplicity, that's out of chapter 8. Okay, I'm not making that up out of my head. St. John of Damascus in chapter 8 makes arguments about how the divine act of creating the world is not synonymous with the divine essence. The eternal generation of the Son is a, a, an action within God that is not synonymous with the divine essence, and it's distinct from creation. The act of creating the world is distinct from the eternal action of generating the Son, and that's why we don't smush and identify everything in God into the essence of God. These real distinctions all disappear, and we would be modalists. How hard is this to understand? Roman Catholics. The act of creating the world is not synonymous with the divine essence. The Son is not an act of the will of God, and therefore absolute divine simplicity is not true. Begetting is not a human temporal category that we equate to the begetting of the Son. There are real distinctions, he says here in chapter 8, between the persons. Real distinctions in God does not entail composition or division. And that is because the Father, he says, is the sole cause and monarchia of the Godhead. He alone is unoriginate and uncaused. The Son and the Spirit are caused. Can you hear me, Dr. Feingold? Can you hear me, Thomists? Can you hear? Caused. 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 Father alone is uncaused. He is the sole cause. He, Father, is the sole cause. The essence of God is not the cause of the persons. 
the spirit, shares the common essence. He doesn't cause himself. Right? This is the entire argumentation of St. Photius in the mystagogy, of the stupidity of the doctrine of absolute simplicity. The Father alone is the sole cause. The Father alone is the sole cause. The Father alone is the sole four times, three, four, four times in this chapter. Or five, maybe. What is the basis for believing this? It doesn't accord with my philosophic speculations. St. John says the basis is revelation. The basis for this doctrine is not Plato. It's not Aristotle. It's not Plotinus. It's not Celsus. It's not Porphyry. It's not Amblicus. It's not any of the Platonic, Greek, Hellenic doctrines. It's revelation. That's the basis for it. So our doctrine of what simplicity is, our doctrine of the Father is the sole cause, it's not from Aristotle. It's not causality in Aristotle read back into God. It's on the basis of revelation. It's because Paul says the Father is the one God. But now if the Father is the one God, does that subordinate the Son and Spirit? No. Because you can have an order of temporal, if we speak of the Father first, or if we were to speak of the Son first within time and space, that does not mean to imply that the Son has pre preeminence metaphysically over the Father. If we speak of the Father as the sole cause, that is not intended to speak of him in a metaphysically superior sense to the Son and Spirit. He communicates his nature, power, dominion, and all properties and attributes that he has to the father to the son and to the spirit save the save being the sole cause that's what saint john of damascus says over and over and over all things in god are common to all three persons except for their hypostatic properties this is why he doesn't teach the filioque okay all things in common common will common sovereignty co common love common power common dominion common providence not common personal properties. What are the personal properties? Father is the sole monarchia and cause. The begetter of the Son. The Son is begotten eternally. The Spirit eternally proceeding from the Father through the Son. Those are the personal properties. Do we know what the meaning and the difference between begetting and proceeding is? In the next very, very next page. No, we don't. We accept it on the basis of revelation. Did you hear me? We accept it on the basis of revelation. We don't know the difference. We accept it on the basis of revelation. The Father alone is uncaused because he is the sole cause. Can you hear me? What is his personal property? To be unbegotten, to be unoriginate, to be the monarchia, to be the arche, to be the sole cause. They all express the same truth and reality about the person of the Father. That means the Son doesn't take on being a co-cause. The Son doesn't take on the personal property of the Father. It's that simple. This is in theology proper, right? We're doing level one of who God is in terms of theology proper. This is distinguished from eternal manifestation, and it's distinguished from God in time and space, economia. Remember that? So there's one simple essence in God. There's one will in God, one power in God, one energy in God. Because God is one. He's one not because we begin reasoning about his divine essence, but because the Father communicates that singular divine essence to the Son and to the Spirit. The Father communicates that power, that dominion to the Son, to the Spirit. We can see then that God is both one and many, and he's distinguished in nature and person, as St. John says on the next page. Uh, that we are still in book eight. And thus, the fact that there is one will, one power, one nature, one energy in God is known because of the fact that they don't operate in, in different contra and contrasts to one another. In other words, the Father can never turn against the Son. The Son can never turn against the Spirit, right? Because they only have one will. There's one will. And because there's one will, there's one energy, insofar as there's one source in God, right? Now, does that mean with Taylor Marshall that there are no different energies? No, it does not. 
because as we've seen in the last talks, actions of God are different. They are, they are one in origin, but they are different in effect. The act of creating the world is not the same act as walking on water. St. John Damascus says, the act of walking on water is proper to the divine nature. The argument I've made countless times over and over that people get confused about, they don't understand what I'm saying. I'm saying if absolute divine simplicity is true, then walking on water is not the same thing as creating the world. Therefore, absolute divine simplicity is not true. Right? If, if absolute divine simplicity is true, then they're all the same. Because the, every act of God is acts absolutely identical to the divine essence in absolute simplicity. So it's just a bunch of gobbled up confusion. Now, another way that we know the unity of the persons, as we said, is by the divine indwelling. The Father indwells the Son. The Father indwells the Spirit. They all indwell one another. The indwelling of the persons has nothing to do with origins. You can't infer the fact that one indwells the other, that therefore the filioque is true, because they all indwell one another. So it has nothing to do with origins. But it does show the unicity of God. Right? Jesus says, I am in the Father, the Father is in me. Same is true of the Holy Spirit. He again mentions the Father as the sole cause and arche, monarchia of the Godhead. Does that mean that there's composed parts in God? No. God is simple. God is simple because there's one divine nature that the Father communicates through the Son in the Spirit. There's one energy because there's one God. Does that mean that all the actions and energies of God are absolutely one? No, they're also many. We know God from his many operations, he says at the end of the book. The created world is in accordance with God's foreordained logi, logoi, logi, the predeterminations, archetypes, and patterns, and exemplars that are in God, in his divine mind, from all time and space from timeless timelessness by his will and design. So this is the uncreated Logi. They are not the same as the divine essence. You did not have to come to be. Therefore, the idea of you, the exemplar of you, is not synonymous with the divine essence. Everything synonymous with the divine essence is eternal. It is necessary. It cannot change. Timeless. Forever. Right? But you are not timeless. Unchangeable. Forever. You had a beginning within time and space, and God did not have to create you. Therefore, the idea of creating you is not synonymous with the divine essence. If it was, you would be a necessary creation. We are not Platonists. The divine reflections, the divine images, are not based on eternal, absolute, simple monad. You are not a reflection of the divine essence. Paul says in Acts 17, there is nothing in, created, in creation like the divine essence. Nothing like the divine usia. Acts 17, nothing in creation is in any way like God's essence at all, period. Very clear. That's why it's wrong to make idols. You cannot, you cannot make an image of the divine nature. You can speak of and do icons about God incarnate because the divine person took on impersonal human nature. That's why icons are appropriate. Hebrews says he is the icon of the Father. Colossians, icon of the Father. When we speak about God and we use words that are anthropomorphic and analogous, analogous and logia, how do we do this? Well, if you've read letter 234 of St. Basil, you know he says the exact same thing. Justice, mercy, love, these are energies of God. The word energies here is often translated operations. They're not synonymous with the essence of God. They are, according to St. Basil in letter 234, energies. St. Basil says, if you think the energies and attributes of God are absolutely identical to his divine essence, then they all lose their meaning because they all become garbled into the divine essence and they're not. you can't know what you're experiencing. St. Basil makes fun of it. He's making fun of absolute simplicity. Letter 234, he says, you're foolish if you think this. So we don't know God as absolutely simple monad. 
We know God through many names and many analogia. And these energies, these terms, justice, mercy, they are analogies. So we can speak of an analogia. And all the fathers teach there's an analogia. It doesn't matter what Romanides says. Romanides says you can never do analogia. Romanides is wrong. They all teach you can do analogia. And they say it is on the basis of created terms. Do those created terms match up to the divine essence? No. They refer to God's operations, his energies. It's not that difficult. We know this is the inheritance of the first thousand years of the church. It's not unclear. It's very clear in St. John Damascus. So you can speak of an analogia energeia if you wanted to. And where does he get this? Well, he gets it from St. Dionysius the Areopagite. We did a whole talk on that. The divine names. The names name energies, St. Dionysius says. They don't name his essence. This is why Aquinas says we have to reject that. I will cite Maimonides. <laughs> Aquinas cites Maimonides against all of the Eastern tradition. Good job, Aquinas. Now you might say, well, yeah, but what about Aristotle? Well, Aristotle, did you know Aristotle taught the essence energy distinction? I don't talk about that a lot because it's not that big of a deal. But if you read Bradshaw's book, he shows indisputably that he did. Because there's a distinction between the action of a thing and the essence of the thing. It's, it's preposterous to identify the two. It would mean Jesus walking on water is the same thing as creating the world and destroying the world. <laughs> it would mean that, G that God had to create the world. No, he didn't. Therefore, the actions of God are not exactly the same as the divine essence. And it all goes back to saying that the Father alone is the cause. Right? If you hold that doctrine, all of this other stuff will flow correctly. You will believe in deification by uncreated energies. You will believe in a real distinction in the persons without composition or division. Here he also talks about the sending of the Spirit into history. He says this is according to the Economia, chapter 12, and that's because the Father is the sole cause. Correct, yes. The fact that Jesus sends the Spirit into time and space and history does not mean that Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, takes on the personal property of the Father. Mm -hmm. The Father is the sole cause and monarchia of the Godhead. What about holy places within time and space? Is that possible? Chapter 13? Yes, it is. God's energies can enter into visible time and space in special ways. Theophanies. Do you remember how many times we've talked about the theophanies? The theophanies prove the essence energy distinction because they are worshipped. You can't worship created forms. But when the theophanies appear, they're worshipped. And they're called God. Okay, so I had some Calvinists say they are revered. They're re they're not worshipped. They're revered. The Trinity, that an absolutely simple essence can't uh, cannot appear within time and space. It can't be God in the Old Testament. The Ophanes, it's a created form. I said they're worshipped. They're revered. No, they're worshipped. <laughs> they're called God. Right? When the Theophanies appear, people fall down. They say, "My Lord, my God." The Theophanies are fully divine. And they are manifestations of God within time and space. They are energies manifesting within time and space. Does that mean that they're impersonal because they're energies? No. The energies of God are always hypostatic. They're always inhypostatized. They're always personal. They're never, there's no such thing as an impersonal energy. It doesn't make any sense. That's why for us, natural laws don't make any sense because they're imp that's impersonal. That's Greek garbage. The operation of providence within time and space, natural laws, are God. That's God doing that. Um, foreknowledge, God foreknows all things. He's omniscient, omnipotent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All the omnis, he goes on to say. He speaks about angels. Angels are different from humans and from God. Uh, they are created intel intellectual beings. Um, we don't exactly understand the form of angels or how that works. Uh, we can only go by what's revealed. 
So we are limited in our understanding of the angelic world. Uh, but we do know it's true. We, don't know, we do know it exists. Um, it goes on to talk about energies in God. He says in chapter 13, at the same time, both that the energies are one and they're multiple. Do you hear me, Taylor Marshall? They're both one and multiple. All in chapter 13. Uh, so the closing of this chapter is important because he closes it by saying, or book one, excuse me, the, the entirety of book one. He closes it by saying that we believe in God having a unity without confusion, the persons indwell without being confused. That shows us both distinction and unity at the same time without dialectical tension. God's energy is simple. It is undivided and yet it is diverse. He even says it's one and many at once. God can be one and many at once without there being dialectical tension. And the simple solution to this is to just not interject dialectics into God. It's that easy. Give up the dialectics. Give up the philosophic definitional simplicity of these terms. We're not slaves to Plato's definition. Uh, God is the end of all things in that he is their purpose, their telos. They all have their uh, order and purpose in him because of the logi, the logoi, the logi. They are uncreated and they are not the same as the divine essence. God is a, an all-seeing eye. <laughs> yes, he says that God is an all-seeing eye. And by that, he designates God's eternal providence. He doesn't mean Freemasons. Okay, Freemasons don't believe in that. They, they believe in deism. Okay, so... So that's actually a perversion of an older usage of symbology. But you will see at times, even in Orthodox churches, you'll see a pyramid with an eye. Uh, and so in the history of the church, there have been times where the all-seeing eye has been used as a symbol of all, the all-seeing power of God, the omniscience of God and divine providence. That's not what Freemasons mean by the all-seeing eye. Okay, so two different things. Freemasons take all these symbols and they corrupt them, right? Think of the Gnostic cross, right? D does the fact that Gnostics use the cross mean that the cross is Gnostic? Of course not. That's, that would be, that's ridiculous. Symbols are determined by their context and their intention. If I see an upside down cross, that might be referring to Peter. It might be referring to Peter as crucified upside down. Or it might be referring to Satanism, an intended uh, inversion of Christianity. So symbols can be polyvalent. They're not always exactly the same. This is the idiocy of a lot of the YouTube community people who look at conspiracy stuff and they say, there's a halo around a saint. That's sun worship. No, it's not. Completely different context, completely different meaning. The, the saints aren't suns. <laughs> They're not participating in the sun, the, the sun sun, right? No. Right. That's zeitgeist tier gobbledygook. Okay, that's low IQ level, like, you know, Alexander Hislop stuff. So we don't, don't be afraid because he says that God is an all-seeing eye. He says it just refers to his divine providence. So that's book one. Uh, book two is going to be more... Of the same, that's going to be for subscribers. You can subscribe to Jay's analysis. Four ninety five a month, six dollars a year, where we lecture on all these books. Nobody else is doing this. Uh, book two is going to be more focused on creation. So we had the doctrine of God and the Trinity and Christology, kind of laid out there in book one. That's the beginning point of theology, Revelation. Book two is about the world, creation, angels, the visible creation, the intelligible creation of the, the spiritual realm. Paradise, Genesis, uh-oh, he believes in creation, uh-oh, uh-oh. Uh, human anthropology and makeup, what are thoughts, what are memories? Passions in man, the fall, actions, free will, voluntary, involuntary, divine providence. Okay, that's going to be book two. Then book three is going to be Christology. We'll, we'll have a, book two will be for subscribers. Book three will return to the public talk in book three, and it'll be on uh, St. John's 
lectures on Christology. That's important enough and refutes so many heresies that it needs to be public. Um, that doesn't mean that for subscribers you're getting something that's not important. It just means that we have to have that one out there. Book four, uh, things that then are more specific to the church, right? Baptism, the, uh, the creed, the cross, the Eucharist, icons, the canon of scripture. Right? That'll be in, in uh, book four. And book four will also then, I guess, be private if we go back and forth. So private, so public, private, public, private for the four books here. And, you know, On the Orthodox Faith is not that long of a book, uh, 250 pages. Uh, we saw all the reasons why it matters. It's a good encapsulation of the, the centuries that come prior, the uh, seventh century, first seventh century of the church, basically, summed up very well. Um, it's one of the first systematic theologies in the church. Certainly people have been writing in a systematic way. People have been doing theology, obviously catechetical lectures worth systematic, but in terms of what we know of as systematic theology, uh, St. John of Damascus' book is, more, is much closer to the modern version of systematic theologies. Uh, so nothing inherently wrong with the systematic theology. Nothing inherently wrong with philosophy. Nothing inherently wrong with doing apologetics. Right? All of this stuff, completely okay in the mind of St. John Damascus. All right, we got some super chats here. Uh, I'll read those, and we'll continue on then with questions, Q&A. So now is the time for super chats. So let's get to these. We got the first one from Jamie Froise, 199. Thank you, Jamie. Scott Morris, $40. What do you think of the Antiochians? communicating communing Antiochian church communing with certain Ethiopian and Coptic churches uh, I don't know this, I don't know the specifics on that but uh, understand that the Antiochian these different jurisdictions are not monolithic right so um, what one bishop does in one place or what one priest does in one place uh, it's not we're not omniscient we don't automatically know every thing that you know all the other churches are doing and therefore if, if i have my infallible peepers out then i know that i shouldn't be in communion with so it's impossible to do that right so i don't we don't i don't i didn't know about this uh if this was done on the basis of you know legitimate ecumenism right the ecumenism of return they call it uh and those ideas can be worked out then i think that's great uh probably wasn't done that way it was probably uh, an ecumenical thing where people don't think any of this theology matters and hey we all believe in jesus let's just get together and then that's the servants of you know uh the cia and the rockefeller ecumenical movement which they say in their biography they started they brag about it and then idiots will tell me that uh i don't know what i'm talking about and i'm a crazy conspiracy theorist even though they write about it in their books so um yeah that's what i would say to that i would say if the theology is legitimately being worked out, which is a possibility. However, nobody seems to be aware of the things that we're talking about here. And these things would be crucial to, and I'm not saying nobody literally, but there's mass ignorance when it comes to the question of the very things that we're talking about here. Why the Father has to be the sole archive of the Godhead and how that affects diothelitism, two energies in Christ, right? two wills in Christ. Uh, why St. Pyrrhus, or St. Maximus against uh, the Pyrrhus and the Sixth Council matters so much, right? Uh, so if they're not doing the ecumenism of return, then that is a scandal. Uh, and the ancient canons say that they are in error and they are liable to discipline for such things. Uh, that's in the canons of Trollo, the canons of uh, the Seventh Ecumenical Council, right? so forth, so on, apostolic canons, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, I don't know about that. Um, but remember that the Russian church is not a monolith. The Antiochian church is not a monolith. Like, the patriarchs are not, they're not little popes. They, they might try to be. Bartholomew, he wants to be the pope of orthodoxy. That's not going to work. Okay. Those, those titles that they have are by custom. If you read the sixth canon of Nicaea, it says Rome's title of honor is by custom. It's not magical divine charism of St. Peter. It's by custom. Nicaea, canon six. Custom. Tradition. 
Roman Catholics, do you hear me? Custom, not divine law. So, yeah. So, Kirill is not the Pope of the Russian Church. Bartholomew is not the Pope of what he wants to be. He thinks he is, but he's a heretic. So, A123, B456, five pounds. What would you say to those who claim biblical prophecies are too vague to be reliable uh, for Christianity to be true? Uh, well, that would really have to be from a stance of ignorance about biblical prophecies. I mean, a lot of people think that there's just a handful, like, uh, well, I guess there's what, like Isaiah and suffering servant and be born of a virgin and Isaiah. No, 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 no. Uh, go watch my talk on um, the minor prophets. Uh, there are prophecies all throughout Genesis, through Exodus, the types, all the typology of all these, all of these figures in Israel's history replying to Christ, the prophecies all throughout the Psalms, so many prophecies in David's Psalms, so many prophecies in the major prophets, the minor prophets, Daniel, I took his name in confirmation precisely because of the importance of Daniel. Daniel says when the Messiah will come. He says when the Messiah comes, the temple system will be cut off. That's how you'll know. There are so many, right, that it is laughable not to see that this is obviously about Jesus. How will we know when the Messiah comes? Well, when Israel is removed from its place, that happened in 70 AD, the, t the temple system ends. Daniel says that it will be under the empire that succeeds the Greeks. Well, that's Rome. And when the Gentiles begin to start worshiping the God of Israel, that's happened for 2,000 years. There are, I don't even know how many, dozens, maybe hundreds of predictions. So if you mean the ignorant people who don't know that there's that many predictions, they're going to say there's not that many. There's like, what, a handful of predictions of supposed to be Jesus? How's that Jesus? No, no, no. There are so many. Jesus says that uh, if they won't hear Moses and the prophets and the predictions, then they won't believe anyway. So don't waste your time, right? When they start saying, show us a miracle, show us a miracle. Jesus does apologetics and says, if you don't believe the prophecies in Moses and the prophets, you're not going to believe if I show you a miracle. So to claim or to think that these hundreds of prophecies, not five or 10, uh, and the, the evangelicals are dumb. They can't, argue with this case adequately because if they if they did they would understand that all of these other prophecies are about the church it's not just predictions of jesus coming it's also predictions of the creation of the church and these predictions in Gen in, in in isaiah of how will gentiles be priests yes isaiah says gentile priests how is that even that's not possible could you imagine jews thinking this what how could there be a gentile priest never we'll never submit to that there have been Gentile priests for 2,000 years. So it's really from a place of severe ignorance that a person would say or think that there are weak evidences from prophecies. Raging Vault 199. Uh, for that, by the way, you can listen, go listen to the prophet, the minor prophets talks that we've done. Uh, listen to Amos, Hosea. Uh, listen to uh, the coming talk that I'm going to be doing on Zechariah all the same predictions of the Gentile church. Um, by the way, people get confused when I say the Gentile church. I'm speaking of the prophecies in the Old Testament that say that when the Messiah comes, the Gentiles will be brought into the covenant and they will worship in the kingdom of God, the one true God of Israel. That's what happened when Jesus came. It's been happening for 2,000 years. Nations and nations of Gentiles converting. This is not that difficult. Paul consistently in his, in his epistles, Romans 15, he says, David predicts the Gentiles worshiping together the one true God with the Israelites, with Jews. How is that possible? It's possible because of Jesus. And the, he's done that for 2,000 years. What Orthodox denom We don't have denominations. There are jurisdictions uh, in, in America. I would stay away from the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese. Uh, they tend to be the most ecumenical, the most liberal, the most under control of the CIA. Um, so I would go to uh, Russian Orthodox Church, Serbian Orthodox Church. Uh, some OCA are good. 
and uh, there's a lot of good Antiochian churches, but they're hit and miss. Basically, just stay away from the Greeks. You should be good. Stay away from the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese. Uh, church, uh, churches that are closer to monasteries, they're going to be better. I mean, in other words, closer in spirituality to monasteries. Um, Warren G. Harding, $5. What's the best refutation of German higher criticism and the philosophical assumptions behind it that you come across? Listen to my New Testament talk. I thought I did a screenshot of that. I get this question every day. Uh, every time I do a stream. Yeah. Listen to the... I list books there. Um uh, but uh, that's a good place to start. But F.F. Uh, F. Bruce's little book, uh, The New Testament Documents, Are They Reliable? Uh, Gary North's treatise, The Hoax of Higher Criticism. Uh, Craig Blomberg's book, uh, The Historical Reliability of the New Testament. Those are good starting places, I'm saying. for, uh, And then and then if, if you're just aware, actually, of the, the fact that modern higher criticism has discarded a lot of the theories that they had 50 years ago they don't even hold them anymore it's shifting sand dude it's it's smoke and mirrors it's academic gobbledygook smoke and mirrors it's not real criticism daniel figueroa one dollar thank you very much daniel appreciate that c joseph od five dollar thank you c joseph od od original dankster mauser the cat five dollars why has the lord blessed amish fertility culture and ethnic continuity punished other Catholics and Orthodox with sterility and invasions. One million Amish by 2060. Now, this is a, a uh, I would say, first of all, the Amish are a cult. Okay, so is it good that they stick to farming and keep away from vaccines and stuff? Sure. But that doesn't mean that the Amish have the right theology. <laughs> Uh, there are plenty of groups, okay, that have avoided a lot of the cultural degeneracy, but we can't determine their theology being true or false on that fact alone, right? I mean, there are probably hundreds of sects in the world, right, Islamic sects or, or other religious sects that have avoided a lot of the degeneracy and the uh, cultural sludge and the biological big pharma GMO damage. However, has nothing to do with whether their positions are true or false. Um, quite obviously, right? That's a fa fa fallacious way to approach their worldview. Many positions, many sects, many groups get things right. But the fact that groups get things right has nothing to do with whether the systems, their belief systems are correct or false. Lawrence Balanag, $2, thank you. By the way, there's plenty of uh, evidence, by the way, of uh, the cultic, weird, creeper uh, traditions of the Amish. The Amish are, uh, I don't know where people get these ideas that, the, that these groups are like uh, some, some, somehow havens or something. They're, they're crazy cults, dude. They even have their own mafia. There's a Mormon mafia. I mean, not Mormon. Uh, there's a um, Amish. There's an Amish mafia. Excuse me. John Kalika's $5. Thomas tells me you're conflating operations at extra and operations at intra. You know, this is the classic, this is the basic bitch argument that uh, Mike Leachione made 10 years ago. Uh, no, we're not. Uh, St. John Damascus makes the essence of energy distinction, period, for God in relationship to the world. And not just God in relationship to the world, but also this is what they don't understand, the uh, eternal manifestation. So... The reason, one of the reasons that we make the distinction between uh, the Father as Sol Arche and between uh, the Son eternally manifesting the Spirit but not being the hypostatic origin of the Spirit is because of this. So some attributes of God relate to time and space. Other attributes of God relate to eternality. Right? So providence, okay? The providence of God, by the way, we know that St. John Damascus teaches the essence energy distinction because Thomas Aquinas rejects it. Okay, so it has nothing to do with ad extra, ad intra. Uh, this is just, is, I don't even know why they come up with this. They think that this is some sort of an answer. It's not. Um, and I'll show you one way that we know that as well. First of all, Thomas says, 
that all of the attributes of God are synonymous with the divine essence. Thomas says the, God's knowledge is the divine essence. Thomas says the act of creating the world is the divine essence. Thomas says the love of God is the divine essence. So there's no doubt that it's a strict equal sign. Okay. But we want to point out, why do we talk about eternal manifestation? Well, providence is an attribute of God that only makes sense according to the world, right? I mean, according to there being a created world. The love of God, however, is a bit different because it's an attribute that doesn't just relate, it does relate to creation, but it doesn't just relate to creation, right? So God's love is an eternal attribute or God's glory is an eternal attribute that doesn't just relate to creation. The glory of God does relate to creation. It does shine forth in creation. In Matthew 17, the glory of God, the divine light, is shown within time and space to the apostles. They see it. They see God's glory. But I thought no man could see God and live. Right? Well, this is how there's an essence energy distinction. So if we think about providence... Providence is an attribute of God that only applies to the world. The love and the glory of God is something that's et eternal and always applied, right? Whether God had created or not, right? These are just examples. I'm not saying the love of God is the glory. I'm just saying we, there is this distinction, right? So what the Thomas guy there is talking about, he's partially right that, yes, okay, some attributes of God relate to the world and some attributes of God relate to all eternity. But he's just talking about God in relationship to himself and God in relationship to the world. Uh, I know that you make the distinction between God relation in relationship to the world and God in relationship to himself, right? That's theology and that's economy. I'm not just making that point, though. I'm not just making that argument. I'm making the argument that if absolute divine simplicity is true, according to what Thomas says in the places where he contradicts, I'm not saying that Thomas doesn't say things correctly in some places. Every time I talk about it, some Thomas goes and says, look, he says what's right here. I know that. The argument is that there's a contradiction in two different ideas about what God is and who God is and what divine simplicity means. Okay. So we all believe God's simple, but what we don't believe is that every name of God is synonymous with the, with the divine essence and that the distinctions are only nominal or logical or human conceptual distinctions. That is explicitly stated numerous times by Thomas in the Summa. In most of the questions, one through 23, he makes this abundantly clear. I'm really tired of Thomas who come to me and they don't understand that. He is very clear. Just read any Thomistic treatise, any Thomistic essay from any known Thomist, Gisson, McHenry, it doesn't matter. They'll tell you what simplicity is. It means that all the names and all the attributes and the actions of God are synonymous with the, with the divine essence. And it doesn't matter if it's talking about ad extra or ad intra. I'm not talking about the effects of, of, of God's act in creating the world. I'm talking about the action itself of creating the world. The action of creating the world in Thomism is the same as the divine essence, not the effect. I know Thomas thinks the world is different from God, created and uncreated. I know that. That's not what we're, ta we're talking about. We're asking a more precise question. We're talking about act itself and attribute. The Catholic Encyclopedia, just look up the, the definition of God's unity and simplicity. In multiple places, it says all of the acts and attributes of God are actually and in reality synonymous with the divine essence and only distinguished in human conceptual nominal categories. Is that clear enough? Ludwig Ott says the same thing. There's no mysteries about what the Roman Catholic doctrine of, I don't know, we don't know what simplicity is. In the no, we know what it is. It is abundantly clear in hundreds of Catholic theologians and documents. And I don't care about the Scotus and the Bonaventure thing. It doesn't matter. Because what matters is what they dogmatized. What does absolute divine simplicity say about all of the actions and attributes of God? They are synonymous with the divine essence. So the problem is that providence and foreknowledge, attributes that apply to the world, in absolute divine simplicity, they have to be synonymous with the divine essence. Thomas says foreknowledge is the divine essence. 
God knows all things in his own essence. The love of God is the divine essence. The glory of God is the divine essence. In a strict identity, there is no dispute over this. It is abundantly clear. The act of creating the world, not the world, the act of creating the world, the action is the divine essence. Actus purus. Act is essence. Actus purus. All are divine essence. It's not hard to figure out what the Thomistic doctrine is. It's abundantly clear in hundreds of doctrines, hundreds of papers, hundreds of essays, hundreds of books, thousands. It's not disputed. It's not debated. It's clear at Vatican I. It's clear at Florence. It's clear at Toledo what simplicity means. It's clear at the Council of Rhymes. Over and over and over in Denzinger. Now, this is obviously retarded. That's why Basil in Letter 234 says this is stupid to say that they're all the divine essence. It doesn't matter if you interject a distinction between God ad extra and God ad intra. No, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. Because we're not, we're not asking you if you confuse God and the world in terms of other places in the Summa. We're asking how it could be that the world is truly distinct from God if this is true. So you're not understanding the actual argument. And every Thomist who does understand it converts because as uh, one of my friends who left the SSPX seminary recently said to me, became orthodox, he said, anybody who grasps this finally, the only, way, the only way they could remain in this is if they are a total tard. Exactly. That's why Basil makes fun of you and says you're foolish. So again, they don't understand the implications of their own doctrine of simplicity. That's the point. That's the point. The point is not whether Thomas says something correct in some other place. The point is not, does Thomas have the right intention? The point is not, is Thomas right about some things? The point is, this is wrong, and this conflicts with what you say in the other places that are right. That's the point. That's the argument. The argument is it's, it contradicts other places. The love of God is not the same as the providence of God, and they're not the same as the essence of God by the mere fact that providence relates to the world and God didn't have to create the world. Do you see that? Therefore, providence is not synonymous with the divine essence. Providence is an operation or an energy of God proper to the world. God did not eternally possess providence in his essence before he created the world. That's retarded. The, the, the exemplars of the world were not eternally in the divine essence from all beyond all time and space. If they were, then creation was a necessity, an emanationist platonic necessity. We are not Platonists. You are. Even though you don't realize it, you are. How are we not Platonists? We believe in Logi. We believe in exemplars. Yeah, they're not the divine essence. It's not that hard. Now, since we make a distinction between attributes or actions or energies of God that are relevant or and apply to creation that are different from attributes and act attributes of God that are eternal and don't apply just to creation, but also, also from all eternity, we know that we can't identify providence with the divine essence. And when Origen did, and he did, he said, I believe that God and Father and providence they have meaning, and since those terms have meaning, and then since they're synonymous with the essence of God, then God had to, at all times and for all eternity, be provident over some created world. Therefore, the creation is just as eternal and coterminous with God. Origin is more consistent than you. Origin believes the same divine simplicity doctrine you do, and he's more consistent. And that's why he's ultimately a modalist and believes that Jesus is subordinate to the Father. Because you equate nature and person in God. You equate action and attribute with the essence of God. The whole root of this is that you're not taking into account the radical nature of what your doctrine says about what simplicity is. Once you realize that it's different, and that's why Thomas objects to the essence energy distinction in St. John Damascus, then you realize this is two different schemes. Now you see why. Your system started with the essence of God. Now you see why you use the Augustinian shield. Now you see why you believe in created grace and not uncreated grace. Now you see why you believe in beatific vision, which we don't. 
Now you see why you believe in all these dumb heresies and why it led you to perennialism. Vatican II is the direct result of the perennialism of ADS. It's a direct shot. And it's absolutely obvious because it's the same one monad doctrine behind all the religions. And I just spent two hours showing you that he doesn't teach that. All right. Hieronymus B, we're almost done here. Does the atonement in Orthodox theology have an aspect of payment for sins for men? Scripture seeks this way, uh, and it jives with the Old Testament sacrifices. Uh, yeah, St. John of Damascus will talk about this uh, in book three. So book three is going, to, and that will be public, that's going to cover the atonement. Uh, so once we've seen the implications of the fact that there's one will in God, it's going to be impossible to have one person in the Trinity turn against the other one and damn the other one. So that's going to immediately refute the Protestant heresy of their stupid atonement doctrine. We're also going to see that it refutes the uh, Anselmian atonement perfection doctrine, do divine, satisf that is divine satisfaction doctrine. Now, the uh, humanity of Christ was offered, St. John Damascus will say. So there is an atonement aspect. There is legal language. There is penal language. It's not what the Protestants think. The Protestants have to come up with a Nestorian doctrine by which there's a second hypostasis in the person of Christ who gets damned. And we don't believe that. But we'll get to that when we get to the meaning of the descent. This is why the Western loss of the descent of Christ into Hades makes them foolish. If you understand the descent of, Hade, of Christ in Hades, you can't come up with this dumb doctrine of the Father damning the Son. But they don't believe that Christ descended into Hades. They think the descent in the creed, the descent into Hades, means that he descended into death or that the Father damned him. They're blasphemous. We you lad, two pounds. Thank you. Lawrence Balanag, five dollars. Thank you, Lawrence. Misty Ernst, one dollar. Thank you, Misty. Very much appreciated. J2 Nick, is it possible for non-Christians to be saved? Uh, no non-Christian can be saved. However, uh, because of the descent of Christ into Hades, we know that the gospel in some way will eventually be preached to all the dead. That does not mean that we have to shirk our duties and that we don't preach to all the nations. We are supposed to. But uh, the descent does say that all of the dead have the gospel preached to them eventually. So we know God is a just judge. Uh, and so in other words, the pagans, the people who die, who never hear, uh, they presumably are going to hear the gospel in some way or at some point in their lives are given some means of light, right? Uh, Paul says this in Romans 2 that uh, those who live without the law are judged without the law. So, <clears throat> so technically speaking, no, no one is saved without being united to Christ. Can God, can Christ have extra normal means by which he can unite people to him? Absolutely, because when he became incarnate, he took on universal human nature. That's what St. John of Damascus says about all the dead. White Top, $2. Thank you very much, White Top. Milun M, $5. Where'd it go? Recently, there was a funeral for a police dog called Axe at, an, yeah, at a Greek Orthodox Archdiocese church. Exactly. Stay away from the Greek churches. They do funerals for dogs. They don't even, they don't know anything. They've, they've left all this stuff. So, John Calicus, $2. Why Palamus got excommunicated by his patriarch? Uh, there's a controversial history with St. Gregory, and, and uh, but uh, a lot of saints got persecuted. Uh, St. Simeon, the new theologian, was, was tossed out of his, uh, his uh, monastery because all of his fellow theologians and, and monastics uh, were basically Pharisees. They were basically Massalians. And St. Simeon, the New Theologian, taught that uh, the experience of God was for all Christians. And they were so prideful and thought that only basically monastics could be saved, they threw him out. St. John Chrysostom was persecuted by the Empress. She had him arrested. So plenty of patriarchs, plenty of holy men have been arrested and persecuted by wicked, corrupt church leaders. But in time, they're vindicated. Uh, I'm sure that, that uh, many of the Orthodox Church, uh, they hate me. They can't stand me especially the ones that are all compromised working for these foundations. Uh, if they had their way, I'm sure they'd have me arrested. Uh, but we know who's right. <laughs> They're a bunch of clowns. And they make it evident, too. They don't, they don't even teach any of this stuff. Do they? they don't believe any of this stuff. Um, Orthodox philosophy, how do we come to know of our individual purpose in God? 
uh, through continual reading of Scripture, St. John Damascus, in fact, says, and through uh, continual attendance at church, liturgy, uh, prayer, uh, God, within time and space, brings these things kind of synchronistically, you know, providentially into your way. Adam Johnson, 499. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Adam. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, I think there'll be some cool streams tonight. I think Vox Day is streaming. I'll probably be checking that out here in a little bit. Thank you, guys. God bless. Uh, in the next few days, book two will be up for subscribers to Jay's Analysis. And then book three on Christology, we'll do that uh, in the coming days. God bless. Have a good night. And uh, stay strong, all you nerds. Remember to like and to share. Help spread the show. Uh, the talks, the lectures, the interviews, and uh, 